We are back for our 10th tea time and final of this retreat. Tea times actually never end, but uh, for this retreat. So let's get right down to questions. Our first question is from Anonymous in Calgary, Canada. Much gratitude to all of you for organizing this retreat with such impeccable skill. It is wonderful. My question is about how to practice loving kindness when one's life is unavoidably entangled with people bent on self-destruction. I have two of these in my life, a very close friend killing himself with alcoholism and my mother who has empath- oh, oh, emphatically sorry, decided she wants to end her life. I am suffering burnout because I am the closest, only friend for both of them, and I feel I cannot abandon them, especially my mother, who is 90 and isolated in a retirement home. Though I can think loving kindness towards them, it becomes impossible for me to give any strength to it. Compassion can even be a struggle at this stage. Can you offer any advice on how to deal with this situation, please? I really want to support them as best I can. Yes. Um, well, the, the, the metta really should be towards yourself. <laughs> so, because you need the extra strength at this time, and you need to just go through the emotions as well. It's unlike, you know, if somebody's been drinking their whole life and hasn't been convinced to give it up <laughs> by this time, <laughs> it, you may fail <laughs> in, in actually convincing them. And that is, we, we have to accept that. And uh, secondly, uh, Yes, it's, it's in the course of nature that your mother, our parents die before us. And if it, if it doesn't happen that way, usually it's even more upsetting if the child dies before the parent. So take your choice. Uh, your, your mother's wish to die early is, is uh, not surprising. They're, when people get very old, especially the last decade, if you're in your 90s, then... Life is mostly what we call the prone de decade, where you, most of your time is spent lying down. <laughs> there's, not, there's not much future. You're drifting into the past, losing track of time, and you say impulsive things that are not well-reasoned, they're not thought out. And if you haven't cultivated over your whole life a kind of uh, spiritual attitude towards how to accept this idea of death and aging, then it's a bit late, and so now you're the bystander here. You're trying to bring some uh, loving kindness and spiritual sense into this, but note that both these people are uh, have a, a whole lifetime behind them uh, of beliefs and, and so forth, and it's just not your job really it's something that you can't really do is suddenly change people's minds at this stage. So you have to practice loving kindness for yourself, and, and that should not feel like some sort of stressful attempt to save everybody. It just means that you should be relaxed. You're in the midst of normality, and that's another thing to help you, is that what is happening here, that elderly people get tired of living and want to die is normal. And that people drink themselves to death, use drugs until they die, etc. That is also normal. It has gone on as long as we know about humans and will go on. And so nothing special is really happening here. This is, this is uh, the norm. And uh, so what does the Buddha ask us to Reflect on five times a day. Illness will happen. Aging will happen. Death will happen. And we'll lose everything in the end. Make sure you understand that clearly because that's normal. That's ordinary reality. Nothing to write home about. <laughs> it's just ordinary. And it happens all the time and is completely normal. What can we do in the face of this? We ourselves can make uh, wise choices, but we can't make it for anybody else. We can't make wise choices for anybody else. And what it says is, all beings 
are the owners of their karma. And you can't make an ethical decision for somebody else. And nobody else can make it for you. You make your decisions in life and you get the results of those. Your mother makes decisions in life, she gets the results. Your friend makes the decisions in life and he gets the results. This is the way it is and we have to reconcile with this. A lot of the language that we hear in the world and a lot of the literature and movies and everything, they, they always seem to manage to find the, the salvation in, in somehow. Somehow it all works out in the end. Well, that's not reality at all. <laughs> How the movie really ends is illness happens, aging happens, death happens, and loss happens. That's how the movie really ends. Now, how should we feel in the midst of this? Should we feel like f frustrated with this? That we should have been able to do something? No, we shouldn't. There's nothing frustrating, or and there are no failures in this. There's, there's, not, there's not a failure that we can't fix illness, aging, death, especially in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, you can see how <laughs> inadequate the entire world medical s system is in, in trying to prevent this illness. In the meantime, uncounted thousands are dying all the time. That's the world we're in. And the Buddha wants you to live in the world that we're in with no, no uh, distortions. He wants accurate, he wants to clearly see it, see it as it is, but don't suffer unnecessarily for it. It is this way, don't suffer. You've got two people in your life that are suffering. It, you can either join them in the suffering or say, well, at least I cannot suffer. And how will you not suffer? Fill your heart with loving kindness, goodwill for yourself and all beings, because we're all in this situation together of illness, aging, death, loss. We're surrounded by people who make bad decisions and they get bad results out of those things. And the, what is the only sensible thing to do in the face of all this is to see it as it is, not add to the suffering, don't burden yourself with suffering, do the practical thing that you can and, and what in the end is it? All you can say to your friend who drinks is, I, I advise you to give it up. <laughs> and without much hope that they will. And to go and visit your mother whenever you can in the midst of a pandemic, you might not even be able to do that. And when you do visit your mother, by the way, just talk about good things, you know, things that she did for you that you look back on with appreciation and remind her that she did many good things for many people. Just keep her on that positive note. And that's how you talk to somebody near the end of their life, always reminding them of positive things and, and say, warn her not to think about negative, anything negative in the past. Don't think about that, mom. Think about good things. And you did many, 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 many good things. Think about that. That's all we can do. And so, yeah, we need a little uh, dose of um, uh, a pep talk, cheer up for you and, and realize that... Um, uh, lots of people aren't open to these suggestions and they will have to face the consequences of their decisions in life and how they choose to conduct their lives. Our next question is from Brian H. from Penticton, Canada. Ajahn, during a very stressful time in my life, early 40s, I used to finish my sittings with a big smile and start to laugh. Forced at first, but real laughter would follow. I would feel great is this laughing kindness like loving kindness? Yeah, it's laughing kindness. And there is laughter yoga. And uh, I used to know somebody in Toronto who became a, laughter, a yoga laughter teacher. Interesting. Um, and I think it started in India, but you just get a bunch of people together. Well, you can do it yourself. And it's not a bad way to start the morning because, you know, it's sometimes hard to face the day and just start laughing in a very wooden way, just ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and you, the, the sheer dreariness of your first 
attempts to laugh will make you laugh <laughs> in the face of things. And it tells you this, that, you know, it's not about what's going on in the world or in your life. Uh, emotions are, you, you choose between these emotions and you can bring laughter into the middle of nothing. There's no, you can be out walking in the desert, nobody's around. And if you start laughing, you will laugh. If you start crying, you will cry. Whatever you do, you tend to do again. So you can bring this sense of uh, lightheartedness and mirth to the situation. And uh, uh, the, the, mind, the enlightened mind is actually doesn't take anything seriously. Uh, it's in a world where nothing is, it, there are no melodramas, there is no seriousness, and uh, it's a mere lightheartedness. So of the factors that are in the enlightened mind, there is nothing, there are no tragedies, there's no heaviness, there's no sadness, there's no grief, no sorrow or anything like that. They may not spend much time laughing, but they're, they don't need to. They're kind of in a state of um, ease and uh, lightheartedness all the time. And so, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very good yoga and um, you don't even need to buy stretchy pants to do this kind of yoga, so. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> next question. <laughs> Our next question is from Madura Siri W. in Calgary, Canada. Metta and Kanti are two of the ten paramis, perfections. In a Jataka story, the Bodhisattva, hermit, practices Kanti, patience. Isn't loving kindness, isn't it loving kindness as well? Yes, uh, I think you're the story is when the, the Buddha is caught, or the Bodhisattva in a previous life is caught by bandits and is practicing patience. And there's another kind of version of it where he's practicing loving kindness. And the bandits in this rather dramatic story decide to saw him limb from limb with a two-handed saw. And he said to the monk, he's talking to the monks as the Buddha, he says, I was this Bodhisattva and I was practicing, quote, patience or loving kindness in various versions. And these bandits caught me and they asked me, what am I doing out here? And I said, I'm, I'm a hermit, I'm a spiritual practitioner and what? And I'm practicing, I'm living a life of patience or living a life of loving kindness. And then they say, well, let's see how patient you are. And then they start cutting off his hands and cutting off his arms, cutting off his legs. And he says, during that time, I not a thought of ill will rose in me. Now, and then he says to the monks, now monks, if bandits catch you and start sawing you limb from limb and you generate ill will to them for even a finger snap, you are not my sons. <laughs> High standard. <laughs> but you know, every, all of them, the, the the literature and the movies and everything of our time is all about, you know, somebody does the slightest thing and you want revenge, you know, somebody, t it's all, it, the revenge movies are the thing, you know, so this is, this is, the fact is that you're never going to get, you're never going to get equal in the world. Terrible things happen and nobody is brought to justice. You need to decide clearly that it's just your own suffering. If you react to the, to negative events in the world, with more suffering, you just increase your suffering. Stop that. You make the decision. Loving kindness is the response to cruelty. Patience is the response to, fr to, to all of the garbage that is thrown upon you. So this is, this is the um, simile for patience that the Buddha gives. As the great earth does not react when loathsome things are thrown upon it, so all of the garbage and dreadful stuff that we toss upon the earth, the earth is non-reactive to this. Just so you, when loathsome things come your way, things are thrown upon you, be like the great earth, non-reaction. That is what patience is, non-reaction. Another thing that the Buddha says about Patience is the highest parami and the highest of the spiritual practices. So you can reverse that and say that 
Impatience is probably the worst uh, failing, is if you don't understand that impatience is self-torment, then you will lead a life of self-torment. You will be impatient about everything, and impatience is suffering. Patience is the end of suffering. So, Our next question is from Sylvia C. in Portland, United States. Ajahn Sona, thank you for these beautiful teachings. My question is about last night's Dhamma talk and returning to life after a retreat. As a lay person, it's important to associate with the wise while still relating warmly with those close to us who may be less skilled in precepts and metta. You talked about needing to find strategies for keeping oneself from getting overwhelmed beyond one's own capacity for loving kindness. Would you share more on this? Yeah, uh, there's all kinds of strategies. Uh, lots of people uh, come to me. Come to me. Well, let's take um, adult children, like so, who have to go and visit their parents and <laughs> deal with them and so forth. <laughs> And they feel an obligation. This is kind of the burdens of, uh, you know, you have all kinds of burdens in life. You have to raise your own family, you have to make a living, and then you have to also, then your parents start to decline. You got all kinds of obligations. You got to go visit them and keep them going. And it all, all can, so, and people are just like, how do I manage this? Well, uh, some strategies, first of all, is that you need to, every now and then you have to treat yourself very well, a bit like a, a prince or a princess. If if you're having these kind of stress, you have to give yourself some gifts and and uh, do that. Not put yourself in hard situations. You have to go visit. Sometimes you 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 must stay at a different place and then go visit. You know, uh, even if it costs you a little bit extra money, you have you need your safe space. <laughs> you need your <laughs> instead of being moved into your old bedroom <laughs> from when you were twelve. So. Um, the other thing is to probably plan ahead. One of them is that parents, I'm just giving one type of scenario. Parents uh, are asking, when are you going to come and visit? You know, when are you going <laughs> to, I need some help. And was, if you anticipate this instead, you decide, you make the plan, you tell them, by the way, I want to visit you and, and I, here's the schedule. And I, you know, you make the, you make the gesture ahead of time so that you can determine when the schedule is. Uh, so it's not, this kind of guilt thing. You, you become assertive and ahead of time decide. And that you pick the time and you say, now I, I have a certain window of opportunity here. I must, uh, and there's certain things I have to do when I'm visiting you. There's a few meetings that I have to go out to. So I'll, <laughs> I need to, I, <laughs> now these could be secret visits to the library <laughs> or wherever. Uh, you need to have little windows of escape that you can refresh yourself with and maybe just go off and meditate for half an hour. This is how you strategize about these things. You need to take care of your, the limits of what you can put up with. Uh, certain times uh, and places where a lot of wacky stuff happens like drinking and uh, that kind of stuff, you might want to strategize to avoid that occasion and uh, show up at another occasion when there isn't a lot of drinking going on. <laughs> You'll have to, each, each structure of relationships has to be evaluated and you have to decide whether you can manage it or not. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, feeling of obligation and... The Buddha's advice, though, is that, you know, not to associate with the foolish and to associate with the wise. So the foolish might happen to be related to you as well or people you work with. And so you really have to strategize and say, you know, yes, I have obligations to people, but I don't need to waste my life force on trying to bring other people around. They have all the time to waste my life and not listen to what I say, but I don't have that kind of time in my life. So it's not necessarily that, that 
association with your relatives and everything is the best idea, and you shouldn't feel guilty if they are very foolish and do not appear to, in the slightest, to be interested in, in improving the situation, you're really not obliged to be wasting your life with them. So that's kind of tough talk, but um, it's the way it is. And uh, you don't have to be angry at them, but they don't have a right to uh, waste your life. And so you need to feel justified in that. And meantime, what should you do with the time that you save? Go and spend some time in a monastery or listen to some Dhamma or go out into nature and be uplifted. Yeah. Our next question is from Anonymous in Rockland, United States. Hello, Ajahn. I echo everyone else in thanking you for this beautiful and useful retreat. I am a psychotherapist for 32 years now and am feeling the burnout of listening to people all day, every day. I don't want to be a doormat, but I feel everyone needs to talk to me all the time, even friends, and I am totally exhausted. There is not a sense for me of boundless loving kindness at this time. It seems a one-way street where I'm always giving. As a result, I tend to want to shut all people out for extended periods of time. The hermit, hermit shack sounds so good to me. My question is, how can I express to patients, family members, and friends that I am not available for periods of time, but still come from a place of loving kindness so they do not feel abandoned? And yes, I want to be a loving kindness therapist. There is so much in this retreat that I plan on taking time to repeat this workshop on my next, on my own next month. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. Yeah, I have great sympathy and empathy for social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors, uh, anybody who works with people, because generally, more or less, that that what used to be a kind of a what religion sort of absorbed and that was expected to deal with is now foisted off onto uh, social workers, like a social worker, psychologist, etc., is a kind of a substitute for a priest, uh, a priest, a monk, uh, a nun, uh, etc. The that is now that that you're, you're functioning as a secular priest, and uh, you're trying to talk, give this person sort of values of how to navigate through life. But uh, basically, uh, I think it's quite, they've set these things up as jobs where you do it, you go in eight hours a day and you do this job. It's just ridiculous. That's not, you can't, and no one can manage that kind of <laughs> burden. <laughs> Social workers should be paid twice as much and work half as long. They're, they're hour, they should, no social worker should ever work more than 20 hours in a week and they should get one and a half times what they are paid now. Uh, because guess guess who's taking who's babysitting your dysfunctional brother while you go to work because you don't have time for this, right? The social worker. It, they're taking care of all your dysfunctional relatives because you don't have time for this. You've got to go to work, right? So if if they're going to, and these are usually very good-hearted people that go into these professions, they, they social where they want to help people and so forth. Now we, the society, takes full advantage of them. <laughs> ah, here's a good-hearted person. I'm going to lay my brother on, on them so I don't have to deal with them anymore. And they're going to have 40 clients like this, 40 people who are messed up, difficult, struggling. And you're going to, this, no time in human history has any one individual ever had to deal with 40 dysfunctional people. <laughs> no. And so flooding a psychologist, a psychotherapist, a social worker with all these people, not a good idea. That I don't, the, who, who makes these rules? Uh, who designs these structures? Because this is a terrible burden. So there should be much more of this. And uh, for instance, uh, monasteries or some monks act as act in this uh, as that function. But we have a lot of support. First of all, I don't have a family. I have 10 people here that, that help do things. I don't have to, 
I have to deal with a lot of secondary obligations. And even then, I don't, I don't sit and talk to people for eight hours a day. There's no way I could do that. Maybe a couple hours, uh, two, three times a week, something like that. So, yes, you have to actually realize that you've, you've just taken for granted an obligation that some institutions and some organizations have decided how many hours you need to do this, and etc. So, you really need to think, it, you've got to acknowledge yourself, this is, this is too much. And so you have to find ways to reduce the amount of time, to get quality time for yourself, and to have no qualms in saying, if I do this, I expect benefits. And one of the benefits is that when I need to go on retreat, I go on retreat. No guilt trips or anything. I just, you just get a message from email. Dr. So-and-so is on retreat and cannot be reached. <laughs> you, will, you will see abbots and monks all the time. You send them a nice email. Ajahn so-and-so is on retreat and will not be responding to messages, etc. Always oh, accept it. Yeah, of course. Well, that's, he's supposed to be doing that. Of course we must do this. So you, you need to introduce this. If this is not part of your your professional idea, then you need to introduce it, that, that the doctor is not in and without any apologies is on retreat because that's the bennies of having to deal with all kinds of people that nobody else wants to deal with. The next question is from Sean W. in Portland, United States. Dear Ajahn Sona, thank you so much for these wonderful and deeply profound teachings. My question pertains only loosely to metta, but it has occurred to me at many points during the retreat, as you've elaborated on the concept of not-self, kama, and samsara, the relief from samsara, nibbana. I can't wrap my head around how, if the self is impermanent and not actually real, that the kama that one generates— or to put it another way, one's, quote, self-generates, is carried with one into the next life or many lives. To me, that seems to fit exactly the definition of a self, i.e. a being distinct from others and whose actions carry forward into future lives, even if said self doesn't con does constantly change and evolve. Could you explain to me how something that persists through many lifetimes carrying the aggregate experience of said lifetimes, along with said being, in some traditions they'd say a soul, is separate and distinct from the idea of a self. <laughs> Everybody follow that? <laughs> well, it's, it's actually easy to answer that, and of course we have to know and sort these things out. Basically what the Buddha is, is saying is that the naive notion of a self which travels through time unchanged is is uh, is problematic because something which does not change cannot be conscious. Consciousness is a process. You're not. It's a stone. You know something that is unchanged cannot experience. So the 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 folk no, notion of of a self or a soul. And by the way, this is the classical definition of a soul in uh, Christian philosophy is that the soul is a is a monad is a kind of a unchangeable imperishable uh, structure which travels through time because they had to think about these things what is the soul when the buddha asked that question he said there isn't one there isn't that idea is completely impossible to reconcile with what we are which is feelings and perceptions and awareness and all of those are processes, not things. So just like electricity, uh, you know, when you flip the switch on, a little guy doesn't run to the end of the thing and then make the light go. It, it's, it's a process where a transmission of, of, uh, of, 
information is all that happens. And one moment knocks into the next. So think about the difference between um, in a do in a ser when you have this, the domino thing, where you, one knocks into the next. So the idea that l most people have is that you kind of take a little steel ball and you run it down a ramp and it finally comes to the end of the ramp. That's, that's the kind of a model that we have in our head about a self going through life. But it's not that way. It's actually, you just knock in the first domino, it knocks into the second, and it falls down. The second one knocks into the third, and it falls down. The first domino doesn't go to the end of the line. But notice that it, it moves along as if something is, is uh, moving along. But nothing is moving along. One, one, one moment knocks into the next. One process moment knocks into the next. Information can be transmitted because the next domino will fall according to the physical uh, forces that are impinged on it. So this is how the, these, this process of, it, process of information goes along. By the way, this, this word information is, is what the way physicists talk now. They talk about that basically information in the universe cannot be lost. And there was a great debate with Stephen Hawking and a few others say, what about in a black hole? Can we lose information in a black hole? And they're all, they're making bets, you know, $5 bets, the greatest physicists in the world making $5 bets. And, and it turns out, well, even in a black hole, you can't lose information. <laughs> so information is just another way of thinking about karma, is the moral, the moral energies. There's no reason why that should be extraordinary. We know in physics that the physical energies the, are transmitted. Information is lo not lost. Why would this not be possible in the moral dimension of existence as well? Many, the brighter types uh, intuit the laws of physics. So you have your Newtons and you have your Galileos. So what, and, and the lesser, those lesser types, including me, do not intuit physics. So if we ask you, if I drop a, a, an object which is light and an object which is heavy from the Leaning Tower of Pizza, which will hit the ground first? And all you peasants say, oh, the heavy one will go faster. No, Galileo said, no, they go at the same speed. By the way, they did this experiment on the moon. They brought a feather and a hammer to the moon when, the, when they arrived on the moon, and they did the famous experiment. In zero atmosphere, which, my friends, you at, Answer this, which will hit the ground first? If I drop a feather and a hammer, which will hit the ground first? They both hit at the same time. And they actually did the experiment. They dropped the hammer and the feather and bing, they both hit the ground at the same time. That's totally un unintuitive, but people like Newton knew that would be the case. Galileo knew that would be the case. So th this, the laws of physics require people who are sensitive to this, very bright. Also, the, the moral dimension. The brightest people in history, the Buddha and so forth, are saying, they're saying, I, the way you think about things is a little off. It doesn't actually work that way. There are laws, believe me. You may not be able to understand this or see this. It may be counterintuitive, but there are laws. So this is just a little brief thing. I don't want to get into a, a, to, a vast discourse on Abhidhamma. <laughs> but it happens by, by process and not by a single object traveling through time. I want to, one more thing. So in the Tibetan tradition, they are attempting to explain this as well. And they come up with something called the storehouse consciousness. And that's how they try to explain the transmission of karma from lifetime to lifetime or but when you when you pause it that when you when you dream that up it really contradicts basic buddhist teachings the buddha never talked about a storehouse consciousness there's no storehouse of this 
information uh, processes through time like energy does. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, only changes. Right. This question is from Tai Ho L in Vancouver, Canada. Dear Ajahn, deepest gratitude to you and the wonderful Sangha at Birkin. This morning in the darkness of early dawn, as I was walking back home along a busy street, I saw what looked like a white line over an inert rock. As I approached, I realized it was actually a skunk, most probably hit by a car, and in agony crawled to give its last breath here by the sidewalk. My immediate reaction was one of pity, not of its current state, as I understand it does not feel anymore, but pity for the suffering and violent, quote, unnatural death it seemed to have experienced, and dying here alone by a sidewalk. I bowed respectfully. Cars passing by may have wondered what I was doing there in the dark with my fluorescent green umbrella tilting down as I was bowing. My question, as we intend to irradiate metta in our gestures and thoughts, is... What thoughts, feelings, wishes would have been appropriate upon seeing this poor animal no more? Well, I think uh, equanimity. Um, this is the, the, the Buddha is quite often coming across these types of scenes, and he says, just so, just so. So one of the things we see, should say is that just so, just so, every living being that is born dies and uh, is vulnerable and... Uh, painful uh, and uh, untimely death comes to all kinds of d different beings. So we see kind of a manifestation of truth there. There are no surprises. And uh, our emotion is not one of distress, but one of may, you know, just goodwill for, for the beings. And uh, also the kind of the motive for us to say, you know, I really need to get working on my practice here because this stuff is happening all the time. It can't happen to me. I'm, I'm, I must make good use of this time. I see death here. Um, the last thing I would say is that I hope you go into creative writing because uh, if you're not already in there, because it was very nice, uh, very micro short story there. <laughs> yeah. Next question is from... Natalia L. in North Vancouver, Canada. Thank you and everyone that have made this wonderful retreat possible. This is my question. How does eating meat relate to loving kindness towards animals? I know that meat that I buy at the supermarket hasn't been killed for me explicitly. However, me buying it may contribute to the biz business that will continue to have it available. Does it mean that the only way to truly show loving kindness towards animals is to be in a vegetarian diet? This is, uh, it needs to be handled skillfully. One, one thing is that uh, people, are the, well, there's whole schools of Buddhism as well that are vegetarian and that, that explicitly say eating meat is, a, is bad karma. Uh, that is in direct contradiction to the Buddha himself and he, he said it, the eating meat is not bad karma. It, it's, karma is created by intention, and intention to kill, etc., is bad karma, bad, will have bad results. So let, we sh shouldn't uh, exaggerate or uh, misexplain things to the world, even for the sake of perhaps saving animals, etc., we can't say that it's it's the act of eating meat that is the has some sort of moral evil to it. It is not. So we need to get that clear. It's secondly, uh, though, the Buddha asked the monks, uh, you know, that not to ever ask anybody to kill an animal on for their benefit, for their food or anything like this. But from time to time, you you end uh, in a world like where humans are basically meat eaters, uh, you will end up perhaps eat, having meat sometimes. Uh, and you can't just snap your finger and make that go away. However, 
a lot of people are vegetarian. They're ethical vegetarians because they, they, they disagree with the killing of animals for that. And that's a, that's a good, that's a noble motive. And uh, if you want to choose to be a vegetarian, it's very easy these days. I, I was, I chose to be a vegetarian in, God, in the 70s. I don't know. And it wasn't easy. <laughs> and then I was a ve vegan for a long time. It wasn't easy. <laughs> and, um, but strangely enough, as a monk, though, I, I do accept, I, I do eat meat, not because I like meat, but because it's part of the process. People, some people offer meat, and I, I want them to not, not be offended. Uh, I accept their generosity, etc. And this is what the Buddha said for monks: is you, you can accept uh, meat and uh, so forth, but don't. People shouldn't kill animals on your behalf and, and feed them to you. So, if I was a lay person, I probably would take up a voluntary life of uh, vegetarianism. But if, you know, I'm invited to somebody's house for dinner and uh, they never even thought about this and they're being very nice and they offer a stew, I might say, okay, I, I might say nothing and just eat the stew. <laughs> because I don't know whether you, you may not make much progress in, in, in converting them to vegetarianism by, by being a, a bad guest. So it's up to you. Um, depending on the circumstances of what's available. And I think it's a, it's kind of a positive, good natured thing to perhaps be vegetarian or by, you know, intentionally try to minimize your meat consumption. But don't confuse the actual act of eating meat with a negative, uh, negative karma. It, it's simply, uh, in, in terms of the Buddha, the Buddha does go, he goes into this in great detail. This is right in the monk's, Vinaya, the, the rules of conduct for monks, and he's very explicit. Monks, you may or may not eat meat. You may choose to be a vegetarian or not. But here's the thing. You should not accept meat that has been seen, heard, or suspected to be killed on purpose for you. You must uh, turn that down. Somebody comes out and says, oh, I killed this chicken just last night for you. Here it is. Here's the... And I think, oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I really can't accept that. Said, Please do not kill things. But if somebody has had a chicken dinner last night and they think, oh, the monks are coming today. Let's, let's save a wing for them, you know. That, that's all right. But So there is, there is judgment and there are issues around this. And so we can't make it too black and white, but it, it, the Buddha just definitely encourages you not to kill, not to kill animals, etc. But the, the eating of that meat is not a karmic offense. Just like receiving a blood transfusion from another person is not, a, the blood is not negative, and you can even receive an organ from somebody who has been killed, right? So you an eye, a kidney, etc. Somebody dies, and you get their organ, and this saves your life. So that's perfectly ethical. But don't kill the person on my behalf. Like if you're nice, you're a billionaire, and you need a kidney. So maybe just find a guy in an alley and just here's some here's some money. Take his kidney. No, don't do that. So uh, it's kind of like that. Next question is from Meta V in Victoria, Canada. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with such clarity and precision and to everyone involved in putting on this very well-run retreat. The level of polish and craft in your videos just continuously increases and it's a joy to behold the whole process. I have found one type of situation that makes it hard for me to sustain Meta. It's when I'm in a rush. In fact, I'm surprised by how quickly frustration and anger can arise when something goes wrong or delays me when I'm feeling this pressured inner agenda. Often I act out of greed to fill my personal time with all the pleasures I can imagine, and this generates a lot of anxiousness and rushed stress. Can you please talk about the dynamics surrounding metta, attachment, time pressure, and frustration anger? Can you offer any insights about what I might be attracted to in the state of, quote, rushing itself 
and where, when, how to bring meta into the equation. Yeah, we, we have a, lo- a whole society that is training us to be urgently in a hurry from morning till night and praises us for our activity. So this is something somewhere in history, perhaps in the 15th century, 16th century, the entire Western uh, civilization went from being a fairly static and passive and not time preoccupied to active and praising activity, including religion like uh, the Catholic religion. This There's a the loss of the ability and understanding of what meditation is and contemplative silence and so forth happened in the 16th century in, uh, in the West, in, in the Catholic Church. And everybody went over to activity. Like, uh, being, instead of meditating there, you've got to be out there hustling around, I don't know, printing books or uh, distributing alms or teaching and this and that. So you got all these activity orders and no, and, and eventually they lost the ability to contemplate. So the contemplation, stillness is the, this, the heart and activity is the minds, but you can't just have, or sorry, the activity is the hands. So you can't just have hands. You need a heart behind it. The hands have to be directed by a heart. And I would say that many of the catastrophes of the Catholic orders, the monastic orders and the priestly orders and the nuns orders and everything, these, there's catastrophes going on, which show that they don't have any kind of serene center to them, that they've been just preoccupied with activity. And this is going to happen uh, in Asia as well with in Buddhism, if, if we take up this kind of frantic need to just endlessly perform good deeds. So this is often called uh, active contemplation or social engagement. And there's a place for social engagement. There's a place for con- contemplation. If you don't, if you don't keep the center and understand how to refresh yourself in contemplation, you will lose it, and bad things will happen. So if you feel yourself rushed all the time and so forth, that's the fault of a whole civilization which stopped appreciating the value of, of, of contemplation and stillness and stopped teaching anybody how to do it, how to be that way. So this is, I guess, why I spent the last half of my life searching for an alternative to being uh, frantically busy all the time. The value of stillness and silence as a refreshment for intelligent action. And if we don't stop all of our frantic activities, we're going to, de- we're going to deplete the entire resources of the planet and we're going to pollute the thing and we're going to, we're going to work ourselves to death is what we're going to do. So we got to stop. Um, and we've already come to that realization. We've, we've de- we are too busy you got to learn to simplify your life and be more serene and so forth. And much will improve. Much will improve. Our next question is from Laura G. in Oberlin, United States. Ajahn, you have mentioned valuing the opinion of the wise. I have been fortunate to meet a number of people who carry great wisdom and have been great guides. However, I have never had a single living teacher that I see as, quote, my teacher. There seems to be an obsession in some circles of having one single teacher, guru, roshi, sensei, etc. But in my experience, it is almost as if each teacher carries a piece of the puzzle. Can you speak to balancing our own inner wisdom and experience with that of outside voices? In your life, who have been your greatest teachers, in addition to, of course, the Buddha? Uh, well, I've had several teachers in my life, and um, uh, this is not only in a spiritual dimension, but in other areas, of course. You go to school, and you have various teachers along the way. And I, I also was a musician, and, and all, <laughs> actually, uh, I was a bit of an athlete as well. So I, I used to be a diver. And you have coaches, right? And so I had several different coaches, and some of them were better. And I, and I learned from each of them and so forth. Uh, and I didn't think there was just one. 
And then as a musician, I had lots of uh, several teachers along the way. And, uh, and then as a spiritual practitioner, I've had several uh, monastic teachers as well. And um, in the Theravada tradition that we're in, we're not really gurus. There are other traditions where they're kind of guru t traditions where you're kind of getting your enlightenment zapped into your forehead from some sort of shakti kind of electricity or whatever that is. Sorry, I wish I could do that. I wish I could just touch you on the forehead and get zap, and you're enlightened. You know, maybe I should start trying that. I don't. <laughs> I've never really tried this. So. Come over here, Pia. <laughs> um, I don't believe in that. It's nonsense. It's not how it happens. The wisdom is awakened within you, and but it doesn't mean that. It's usually the words of another, the examples of another, that help you move towards that. And humans learn at the school of example, they learn at no other. So we, we need examples, we, we, we emulate, we, we learn from that. So find skillful people, and they're not just one skillful person in the world, there's, there's several, and they, and you can learn from different schools. But I, you know, there's, uh, at the same time, I, there are people who, who claim to be wise and helpful and everything, who turn out to be charlatans, <laughs> absolute abusing charlatans, and you, you know this happens. So you better be, you better keep your sense of judgment and, and moral and ethical boundaries as well in the midst of all this. You need to. You need to question. Yeah. Our final question is from Anonymous in Kiel, Germany. Dear Ajahn Sona, thank you for this retreat and your inspiring teachings, and thanks to the team making this retreat possible. Have you got any advice or suggestions how to go on in daily life after the retreat, especially during the week, and then there is a lot to do at work? I often find it very difficult not to neglect the practice, although I made the experience that it is better to keep on. You mentioned there are techniques not to fall into old habits. Have you already given a talk about that? I hope it is okay to ask, but I was curious, but maybe one has to find out those which strategies work for oneself. Best wishes and thanks. Yeah, there are there are techniques which are not just exclusive to Buddhism for um, breaking old breaking habits and, and forming new habits, and uh, we're not the only ones that know about this. So there's all kinds of uh, little motives that you can give yourself. You can you can make a very clear uh, determination, write it down, and then decide to commit to it for a period of you know forty days or ninety days or or smaller chunks, you can decide to keep it up for a week. And you, every day you need to note whether you accomplished it or not. So there's a, you can make a, if you really want to get elaborate, make a, a, a board with lights in it that each one has a switch and you switch it on. You, one, you, you succeed one day and you switch that light on and the next, up to 100 lights. Uh, if you don't have lights, then make a check mark in your book. Get your book. Make daily determine, determine, you know, overall determinations, accomplish things, and keep a record of it every single day so you know when you failed, etc. And then don't give up, do it again. Check out the environment, what's triggering your lack of interest, and in, you know, why can't. Why are you failing to meditate? Why are you failing to keep up your practice? What's the distraction in the background? Change your environment. Associate with different people. Read different things. Give yourself some rewards for doing good things, um, uh, etc. So motivate yourself in all kinds of ways. And we're not the only ones that know about these motivations. You know, lots of people have thought skillfully about this. There are books on how to motivate yourself and how to keep things up and how to accomplish goals, et cetera. So this is um, something that one should uh, bring into one's life. Uh, monastic communities often do this for you. you, you <laughs> if you're in the forest tradition, <laughs> Ajahn Chah, you, there's a bell 
that rings at three o'clock in the morning and you better get up. <laughs> there's a strong, there's consequences if you don't. And it's not, you're not in prison. You chose to be there because there's motivations. You're there because the whole community is kind of, is uh, taking the time to pressure you to change your structures and, and follow this. And sometimes they're very uncomfortable. Some, sometimes you just don't want to do it. But that's why you're there is because sometimes you don't want to do it. And, and if you're not there, you won't do it. But when you're there, they'll make you do it. <laughs> so you can make a, a determination with other people to check in on a regular basis and say, have you done your determination? Have you kept it up? And why not? And like even a confession, say, I failed to do it this time. Do you see why you failed? Have, you know, you're checking in with somebody. So this, these are all skillful techniques used in this sangha and, um, and in retreats, etc. And we even made you sort of sign up for the retreat. Like, you can skip out. I'll, I won't know. <laughs> but just by signing up, I'm going to do the retreat. I am committed to the retreat. This is, this is what's just a, a way to help you. This is a way for you to help yourself by saying, okay, I've made an agreement here with a bunch of people and I'm going to keep, keep this up. This is all it is. It's just helpful means to, to do these things.